Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Dave Solano, and I uh, represent Library Sales here at Springer. We've got a fantastic day lined up for you. This is uh, what we're deeming the E-Only Library Summit. Thank you once uh, very much for coming in, and uh, we look forward to a fantastic day. So when we were coming up with uh, a concept for this particular event here in Boston, we came up with, obviously, the, the E-Only Library, and, you know, a very provocative term, if you will. You know, what are our libraries going to look uh, academic, corporate, and, and government, what are they going to look like in, in five years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, um, as we continue the migration from PDE. So we figured we would, we, we, we would put together an entire uh, event around it. So thank you once again for coming. In March 2000, the Director General of Polytechnic testified in front of the Education Commission of the Quebec National Assembly about the difficult financial situation of Quebec universities. He informed the elected representatives that some recent government reinvestment in the universities was very timely, as Polytechnic had considered closing its library. Two years earlier, one quarter of the jobs at the library had been abolished. During the 1990s, 70 percent of our print subscriptions had been cancelled. In the mid-90s, we had no budget for monograph. We had become totally irrelevant. Where are we now, 12 years later? Our library is now housed in a new, attractive, modern facility. The number of seats has quadrupled compared to 2000, and we still need more seats. Our, collect uh, our collections expenditures are more than twice the level of 2000. Our cost per downloaded article is the lowest in Quebec, and 93% of our collections expenditures are now for electronic content. A new director took charge of the library during the summer of 1998. One of his first tasks was the development of a five-year plan. Our managers made countless presentations to the various assemblies, departments, and other forums, explaining not only our plan, but the major transformations that were taking place in the information world, which could only be made available to them by the library through the implementation of that plan. The following year, our collections budget was increased by Hold yourself, 50%. The next year, another 25%. By 2006, our collections budget was twice that of 2000. We wanted to pre-select the future packages we get into. Okay? We knew they'd be coming from all over the place. They'd be pressured to take anything and everything. And the tendency amongst certain universities was to do, actually do that. Jump on it when it comes by even if you don't know if you need it. So we decided to figure out if we need them ahead of time. We had three studies, three classic ways of doing usage studies, but we wanted to get out of that a single indicator for each of the journals. Basically, we gave a score of one to nine to each journal in that list, okay, based on the intensity of use, either in ILL, citations, or publications. We ended up validating with that that the recent CRKN journal deals were good for us, that we would keep them at the time of renewals. The average cost per downloaded article for each collection was calculated. Polytechnic had the lowest average cost per downloaded article, 84 cents per article downloaded. To us, these results were a validation of our approach for selecting journal collections. Our users now have access to nearly 100,000 books. When we combine the counter usage data from 2007 to 2011, we observe that 26% of the e-books have been used. And in some collections like engineering, computer science, chemistry, it exceeds 40%. My presentation has been on the development of a strong e-content library at Polytechnic. We were irrelevant 12 years ago, and we regained the trust and support of our institution. The content we acquired is heavily used, and our users tell us they want more, and we're committed to give them more. I'm going to give you a um, quick overview of um, kind of the context of the survey, and then the implementation, and then um, Deborah's going to give you a go through a, a, an analysis of some of the most interesting and kind of uh, outstanding results we found so far. 
Uh, we have a robust ebook collection that's, that's over 300,000 titles. I think that's one thing to keep in mind with these results is that our users are used to being in an environment that's heavily ebook. Um, the survey responses, we had a 57% response rate. So you can see that this is um, really outstanding. 71% of the respondents, the faculty and students reported having, use, having used ebooks. So here's an overall slide that shows um, preference. One of the questions we asked was, how do you feel about ebooks? And that was the wording that we used. And the responses that we offered to them were in the dark blue, I prefer ebooks. In the light blue, ebooks can be an acceptable option. In the red, the negative responses here are shown in red, and the positive responses are shown in blue. So the negative responses, I use ebooks, but I prefer print books. And um, the dark red, I do not want to use ebooks, but sometimes there is no choice because at, at Wellesley, we, we don't have an exclusive one format policy, but uh, so if somebody requests a, co a print copy of something that we have an e-copy of, we go ahead and buy it. But we have many, many, many books that are in electronic format that we don't have at all in print. So here's a, a slide. This is a slide of ebook preference broken down by discipline. So on the farthest to the left, there's arts and humanities. In the middle, social sciences. And on the, on the farthest right, um, the science. So you can see here the percentages for all of the disciplines is above 40%. So all of the disciplines have an ebook, I like ebooks, of over 40% of the responders for faculty and students. But not much difference. Does this surprise you? Because it surprised us a little bit. There's not that much difference between the disciplines. So here's a juicy bit for you that we find very interesting, but we don't really know what it means yet. We asked them, if you had to read 10 or more pages of an ebook, how would you prefer to read it? But here you see very high happiness <laughs> with ebooks for people who are reading on a smartphone or a tablet. And again, very high happiness for ebook reading devices. And pretty good for computer and laptop reading, and then really low here, very low. People who are printing out do not like ebooks. Very interestingly, from a very small sample size that we've, that we've been able to work with so far, we're getting a lot of negative responses about how these ebook devices are working with our academic collections. So that's very contradictory to what we see here. Because even this one that's specific to ebook reading devices is very high. So, this is something we need to understand more. So, the most important thing that faculty and students said they expected was the search within the text. And that's kind of a given. Reading offline came in at 82, 83%. And downloading to a device came in at about 65%. And then, third, Coming in at like 52% was unlimited printing. Isn't that surprising that it's that low? I mean, I hear all the time librarians saying, what we need is unlimited printing. This is not the priority right now. Maybe it was five years ago or last year, but now that's not the priority. And I think that's what we're seeing is that the printing is slowly changing for them. A lot of the faculty are finding ways to work on an iPad because they've got more money and they can actually afford an iPad and a laptop and a smartphone and a Kindle. <laughs>
is is a great thing. It, it just it, you know so use it, just any use is is good use. Uh, and what we found is that there's actually um, some platforms still require training, and that's not what you should need. It's a general thing. Is platforms fatigue. Uh, ultimately, the publisher or someone should be invisible so that you get to the content as quickly as possible, no matter how you need it. I'm going to be covering a variety of different formats and talking about the evolution of the digital libraries and the sciences at Harvard. Um, I've been doing an analysis of our usage for the last five years for our indexes and abstracts, and I can pretty much, well, I get, bet you could guess, what's the usage going like for the most part? Down, exactly. Yes, except for one or two, most of them are dropping. Um, our best used index and abstract comes out to about $3 per use, per search. Um, we're getting stuff that's in the six to ten dollar range for some of the big titles. So, for instance, Inspec is in that range from six to ten dollars per use. We're thinking that's getting kind of high. However, we're hearing from our faculty, from our grad students, from our postdocs, from pretty much everyone that Google Scholar is becoming the first choice of access for our collections. E-journals. Well, not a surprise. We pretty much canceled all of our print. I would say that 97% of our collection is available electronically. We do see increased usage of our e-resources, particularly our e-journals, every single year. I've got statistics going back at least a decade for most of our e-journal packages. E-books. Yes, we have e-books. Um, I actually am one of the first people to have bought an e-book package for the whole university, and that was not that long ago. Um, Harvard has been rather conservative in buying its e-books. I'll mention, for instance, that Safari is heavily used. I mean, it's very, very heavily used compared to our print uh, manual, computer manual collection. One of our titles, it's kind of hard to believe this, but I analyzed it twice just to make sure. One of our computer manuals has 118,000 uses. Yeah, I thought that was an amazing amount. I, I floored me when I first saw that number. We also have to determine the level of preservation. Uh, we do have a digital repository system that is high level for preservation of any form of digital material. And then we have to decide, do we want it at the high level or do we want it at some medium level or is it just low level stuff that we want to make sure is there for a year or two. Another aspect is, is what type of content and in what format. So is it just HTML, is it HTML and PDF? How about images? Um, an example would be we found out, much to our dismay, um, Scientific American, you all know that wonderful journal. Yeah, in the HTML versions of some of the aggregators, the images were missing. Well, that was the most important thing about Scientific American articles we found out from our faculty because they use the images for their presentations and their lectures. So we ended up having to go right back to Nature Publishing Group and purchasing their version, which had everything complete. There was just like no choice in that, in that matter, even though we were relying initially on the aggregator version. In 2008, our director decided it was time to move beyond uh, the 10,000 net library ebooks that we had. So I proposed that we go with uh, the Ebrary Academic Complete collection, which at that time was almost 38,000 titles. It's now over 75,000. One of my pet peeves uh, ebooks and e journals are not being uh, provided with. ISBNs and, and ISSNs that are unique to the e-content, and that causes a lot of problems. At the end of fiscal 11, we, we bought, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Waldo, it's the Westchester Academic Library. Uh, we, we can participate in that in Connecticut. They had Oxford and Cambridge uh, e-journal packages, and they were only about, about 250 titles each, and it was a, a very uh, precise, peer-reviewed content that was a very reasonable cost per, per price and the usage is incredible. And that year we also got the Sage Premiere and we got the Sage uh, Deep Backfile because we had some money to spend. And uh, the reference librarians told me they started seeing those results come up in Journal Locator the minute we, we subscribed to it. And it's, that's been a real success story. It's the perfect kind of thing for a place like Fairfield size. Um, based on feedback in talking to tech services staff, reference staff, etc., we've seen errors in titles, which is probably the biggest issue. Um, we see incomplete 
information. For instance, as you mentioned, ISBNs are missing. Um, sometimes they only have one author listed and there might be three or four authors, so the, the alternative 700 fields aren't there. Um, many times the 650 fields are lacking or are inaccurate. And so while most of our users we know from analysis don't use the subject headings, the librarians, our reference librarians, use them heavily. And so having accurate subject headings is very important, at least for our, our reference librarians for accessing those materials. We're still all suffering from, and this is a, a current cliche, I know, silo legacy systems that don't talk to each other. And that has got to go. And I don't have the answer, but I think there's going to be another game-changing game something that comes along even in my lifetime. I am the editorial director for business, economics, and statistics in Springer's New York office. Uh, I have a staff of eight editors who report to me. And overall, we publish about 150 books a year and between 65 and 70 journals. Uh, one of the sort of key ideas here is uh, to ask in an e-world when content is available anywhere, anytime, by anyone, instantaneously, they can just post something up to the web, why do we even need publishers in the first place? I think there's another whole uh, sort of purpose that we serve, which is, uh, this is an example of it right now, um, and that's community building and really working with all of the different stakeholders in the publishing process. Our authors are also our readers, um, and uh, we uh, really see a, a very exciting and dynamic role that we play in bringing together librarians, professors, students, um, uh, all the people who are involved in different parts of the process. E first, print second. And it changed everything. Because until that point, the whole idea of electronic publishing from a publisher's point of view was that we did books, we did journals, and oh, we also have an electronic version of this. Um, and you know, this could just be a scan or a PDF, um, but it was basically a, a kind of a static version. Um, and the idea now was that we really are an electronic publisher. Books and journals are the medium that we know, but that is really designed to get us to the electronic uh, world. Another thing that we like to do is work with authors who can jump from one medium to another. So they might uh, do a, a, write a, an article in one of our journals, and then we see, well, this is really cool. Uh, this could be developed, it could be expanded into a book. Uh, we have a, a kind of a, a template or proposal checklist of things that we ask an author to prepare uh, for our review and for external review, and this includes information about the content, what are they writing, chapter outline, who are they, to provide their CV with a publication record. You know, we're usually looking, especially if it's somebody um, who's proposing a book, um, we want to see that they have a publishing record in journals uh, usually uh, beforehand, but it's still okay. Sometimes we'll, we'll publish somebody uh, uh, even if they haven't published a lot already. In some cases, we'll also ask that the entire manuscript, when it's finalized, uh, also go for review. This is particularly important in mathematics and statistics where the publications are for the ages. Once something's been published, especially in math, this is going to be the word for the next 50 years. You want to make sure it's perfect. And I was going to call this the future, and then I realized all these things are happening already. So now it's, I would call it the frontier. And this has everything to do, I think, with um, the electronic environment and how we're thinking about what it is we publish. Um, already for the past few years, uh, this isn't even new anymore, the idea of electronic supplementary materials um, where authors can post data sets and all kinds of other things. Textbook publishers have been doing this for a long time already. Um, Springer's um, model was built by librarians and that is not hyperbole. In 2005 we got our LAB members, our library advisory board, and we said what do we do? And they said this is what we do. The first thing is no digital rights management, period. When we saw the survey, um, when uh, 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 Steve and Deborah talked, it's not just online access. You can download it to a USB, you can put it on your computer, you can put it on your tablet. Uh, we actually have EPUB coming out for 11 and 12 books in a couple months. This means it's going to be built exactly for the iPad, exactly for that. We have a free Springer Link app that your users can authenticate through your Wi-Fi. So they can go through and access this the way they want it, and they don't have to worry about it disappearing because it's yours. We are Portico, we are LOX, we are CLOX compliant. When you buy it, it is yours forever. 
There are no seats. It's unlimited usage. It is not a Safari model. When you buy it, you have the rights to archive, lend, uh, loan, so on and so forth to everyone all at once. Um, we talk about textbooks. Well, there it is. You find a Springer book, you put it in um, Blackboard or however they communicate. Boom, every single person can use it at the same exact time. Discoverability, every single chapter has a DOI, period. This way, it's journalization of content. If you want it, you can get it, and this gets into the conversation that Mark said. And we're slowly getting down to that as well, and we give full text metadata out to whoever can process it. Uh, we are compliant with all major link resolvers. Discoverability, ease, get it when you need it. Fully indexed by Google, they're getting better. Lastly, collection approach. We do sell by the collection model. And what that means is that there are no duplications. You, we break it down by copyright year and by subject. There is no way, if you buy through this model, that you can buy the same book twice. It was just one more thing, and that gets into the aggregator question and a lot of different ones that we had talked about today. This is our solution to that, right? Um, next one, we do not exclude anything. If you want an eref, it's in there. If you want a textbook, it's in there. Monographs, key series, we exclude nothing from our collections. If you buy from us, you are getting the complete Springer library. This is not module XYZ. This is for your users, no matter how they want to use it and where they will. All right, thank you guys. Thank you so much again for coming. Thank you for everyone for being involved. And um, drinks. <laughs>